Hello and welcome to the stage uh, where we have API and architecture design related topics now. Um, and the stage and we, uh, where we and have, we API have and some architecture design related topics. Interesting now, uh, technical uh, issues here. So we and we have API some so let me uh, let me stop a few things. Okay. So now uh, we have David Giraldi and we have David Jones Giraldi, sorry, and we have great yeah. new apps faster with a gateway for multimodal APIs. And this kind of continues nicely the open source topic that we left uh, you guys with after me and Ale Arvis talk on the Finnish API guidelines. And uh, I just have one thing that I want David to explain in his presentation, which is uh, why is he going to say that you don't need API design to create APIs? I am so curious to hear that. But welcome <laughs> David, uh, to the stage. And um, yeah, remember, you have to answer me that question <laughs> during or <laughs> after. I hope I'm, I'm going to actually answer it through this presentation. <laughs> but oh, you can yes. always call me on it if I don't. <laughs> OK, good. And people, keep your uh, questions coming in the chat. And otherwise, the stage is yours, David. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you can all see and hear me just fine. Um, so as just mentioned, so I am going to talk about Stargate, uh, which is a gateway for multi-model data APIs. Um, now, before I do that, though, and before we get into Stargate, just, just a little bit, um, actually, I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. So um, my wife and I, we we both have very close Finnish friends. We've traveled to Finland. We love Finland. And a matter of fact, both of our girls happen to have not Finnish names, but Finnish words in their names. So one is Lahia, the other one is Lumi. Um, but I'm going to try something. And I can't see any of your faces. So I don't know if this will go horribly. I'll just have to find out in the chat. So Suomi on Kaunas Ma, Suomi on Kumea Kieli, Ya, Kavi on. There you go. <laughs> so hopefully I got that right. Um, but yeah, so I am a developer advocate, uh, or some might call us developer advocate avocados. Uh, and uh, for the last four years at Datastax, um, I've been teaching and training and doing support for all things Apache Cassandra, right? Our goal in, in life these days is to um, help as many developers, as many admins and every and everybody kind of understand Cassandra, the world of Cassandra, now Stargate and such, and do that all for free, right? So that's something that's really important to us. Um, just looking at a quick agenda of what I'm going to cover in the 20 minutes. Um, first thing is talking a little bit about the rise of data gateways and why we're even having this conversation. Then digging a little bit deeper into the architecture and implementation of Stargate. And then looking at Cassandra itself as a multi-model database. If you're not familiar with Apache Cassandra, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer because that really comes in, that really kind of joins with Stargate and what Stargate's doing. And then finally, I'm going to send you off to Stargate itself um, so you can take a look. So the first thing here is the, the why, right? The why of the rise of data gateways. So for my developers out there, the ones watching now, I want you to ask yourself some questions, right? The first one here being, do you really like learning a bunch of different query languages? Now, as a programmer myself and somebody who's also been a DBA, um, I kind of really do like a lot of the individual languages, if I'm being honest. Um, matter of fact, if you've ever worked with graph databases, they're in Tinkerpop, right? There's the Gremlin language. It's actually really quite fun and such, very verbose. But the challenge is, is from a development standpoint, there are so many different languages that databases speak and that the various different kind of capabilities that we use speak. And so it can be really challenging for all developers to learn all of these that are relevant in their particular sphere. It's much easier to just say, say, save a JSON object or something like that, right? Um, it makes our programming time a lot faster, um, and we have a lot less kind of mental load, especially if you have new people coming onto the team. And that's actually why things like ORMs, things like Spring Data are just so popular because it provides a single language that I can use regardless of what the data store is, right? And then the next question is, do you really want to have to worry about storing what your data model is in your code, right? And have to represent schemas, NDD beans, things like that if you're talking Java. Um, that's just another you know, set of work that we need to do 
uh, as developers when we're working with databases and data stores. And then the final one there is, uh, do you really want to have to always install your databases to work with them? You know, if you're talking about like relational databases, single instance databases, that's not so bad. But when you get into the world of distributed computing and distributed databases, that becomes a lot more complex. They're very hard to embed into your uh, code, especially if you want to do automated testing and such. Um, and it, again, it's just yet another barrier to coding and getting your apps up and running. Then if we move over to our DBAs, right, our operators, our SREs, the folks who are actually running our databases, um, there are a lot of things that they usually have to control for for developers using those systems. One in particular is, you know, how many DBAs out there really want uh, developers executing any query whatsoever against the database? Um, and matter of fact, I mean, it's not so much of a trust thing. It's just sometimes some bad things happen, right? You don't want to be able to, um, you know, execute a query that might bring a database to its knees, or, or you know, you know, do something that might cause like a security issue or something. Um, a lot of times, having control for a whole range of ports, lock things down, um, especially in the cloud, right? Because when we have devices that are up on cloud instances, those are publicly available. Um, so there's all sorts of extra work that is needed from IT staff and from you know uh, admins and such to control for those types of things. Um, so it's with the questions from the developer and the questions from the administrators here that we have in mind when thinking about how Stargate is actually built. And the relationship between the two uh, developers and DB admins, it's not always bad or anything like that. Or I think, and I've, I, I should, I've lived in both of these worlds. I think we're just coming from different perspectives is all it is. We have different needs. Sometimes DB, uh, DBAs may feel like the developers are asking a little bit too much, and the developers in turn may very well feel that the DBAs are a little too controlling, right? So part of what's going on here with Stargate is to help kind of both of those uh, roles, if you will, and to help abstract out some of that capability. Um, so each one kind of gets what they want. So the whole rationale here for these this data gateways rationale is to provide a ubiquitous API layer that speaks the languages that developers, regardless of language, regardless of programming language, pretty much all talk, right? And also staying with APIs that are modern, right? How many folks still wanna be working with XML? I mean, at one time that was like awesome, uh, but not so much anymore. Um, so Stargate provides essentially a proxy that goes in between what the developers are doing and the, the data store and provides APIs that are pluggable that most are familiar with, things like GraphQL, REST APIs, JSON, gRPC, and, and I'll talk about more uh, in, a, in a moment here. And then the data store end, right, provides a pluggable architecture that allows you to plug in multiple data stores, so then it giving the DBAs control in that layer, but then also making it so developers can talk just to the APIs, and then they can talk to whatever data stores. So let's look a little bit deeper at more of like, how is this you know, how is this architected in the implementation? So as I mentioned before, just a moment ago, Stargate is a proxy layer that lives in between the developers and the data store. And in this case, it's a, it's Apache Cassandra, and I'm gonna talk more about that, but it's not limited to only Apache Cassandra. One of the key things though, that I want you to take away from this is that Stargate wouldn't, wouldn't really be that functional if all it did was provide a layer of APIs and that was it, right? Especially for things like NoSQL distributed databases where we're talking, being able to perform at very, very large scales. You know, we're talking clusters that could be thousands of nodes large or something. Um, you need in, to ensure that if you're gonna have some API layer, that that also can perform at that scale. And so Stargate has, it actually uses the Cassandra coordinator code, it's open sourced, Cassandra coordinator code. And for those familiar with Apache Cassandra, or if you're not, um, it's known for its huge scale and being able to scale whether you're talking a couple nodes or talking thousands of nodes. And the query coordinator code is kind of a key part of how that all works. So Stargate has actually open sourced that part of it. And as it's using that very coordinator code um, to, to coordinate all of this. And it's not just a project. This is an open source project. It's not just from Datastax. We're actively collaborating with Netflix, Yelp, and Walmart. Most folks will know those names. Um, and they are all known, especially Netflix, right, uh, of being able to use Cassandra at huge scales. 
So if we take that layer that I'm talking about, that proxy, we dig into it just a little bit more, right? You can see some examples here. So um, at the developer layer, whether you're talking somebody is coding in React with Node, Swift, Spring, Quarkus, whatever, the languages and the frameworks don't matter. That's kind of key, right? So that way you can say, use the same API languages regardless of what framework or language you're coming from. And Stargate just provides a set of integrations that are used there, and it abstracts out the storage layer, right? Um, so again, it separates the two um, and abstracts one layer for the, uh, for the developers and another layer for the admins. So Stargate, again, zooming in a little bit more, right, is built of a set of API extensions and persistence extensions. And there's also an authentication layer here. Um, so let's just take a look at some examples. So from the persistence standpoint today, if you were to use Stargate right now, right, um, it supports open source Cassandra. It supports the upcoming Cassandra 4.0, which is going to be GA here very soon. And it also supports DSX Enterprise 6.8 and above. It provides um, an authentication layer, and it provides today a whole set of APIs with REST, GraphQL, JSON documents, and CQL. There's also more that's coming that's being incubated with Kafka, gRPC, Events, and Spark. Um, and again, this was built with a pluggable framework in mind. So you can add in other APIs as those make sense, and you can add in other data stores. So right now, Stargate might be pretty paired with Cassandra, and there's good reason for that, but it's not limited only to Cassandra, right? The, the hope and the idea is that eventually other databases will come into play here as well. That's why I have that X run with the, the dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let's look at a, a little bit of Cassandra, right? So if you're not familiar with Cassandra and, and what it does, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a primer here. But Stargate works extremely well with, with Cassandra. You would expect that it does. It's coming from DataStacks originally. It's using some of the Cassandra code, right, uh, to, to do its job. Um, but there's, there's a really good reason for that because Cassandra came out of the NoSQL uh, revolution. It's a NoSQL distributed database. Um, and so this is this is something that has evolved past what traditional relational databases would do, and it's really really built to be able to maintain its performance at scale. Oh, I lost my uh, earpiece. Give me a second. There we go. Um, it's really built to be able to maintain its performance at scale, and it's built to be extremely resi resilient. Now, when I say it's a distributed database, what do I mean? Well, Cassandra is built of individual nodes. A node is an instance of Cassandra. So right here, I actually have a database. And any one particular node can handle two to four terabytes of data. And when I say in throughput, lots of transactions a second at core, I'm talking thousands. The reason why I don't give an exact number is because it really depends on how vertically scaled an individual node is, right? But it's a distributed database. It's not just comprised of one node. It's comprised of many nodes. And those nodes are in a peer-to-peer -peer system, a leaderless system. Any node can do what any other node does. And they communicate over a protocol called gossip. And the point of that is whether a node is coming up or down or being added or if it like something happens to one, they're always communicating. They're communicating uh, the status of the nodes and you know the, the data they're they're holding on to and all that kind of deal. And then nodes are connected through what's called a ring or a data center. And Cassandra makes really cool use of this. You can actually have as many data centers as you want. Um, and you're gonna see in a minute where that comes into play with Cassandra. Now, one of the really neat things about Cassandra is its scalability, its ability to horizontally scale, right, indefinitely. Um, so if you need more throughput or if you need more capacity, if you want to, like, say, double your throughput, you double your nodes. Now, the chart here, this was actually done by a third party. It only goes up to 32 nodes. Um, there are uh, installations out there that are thousands of nodes. This holds true. And, and you know, this is something that's very well proven with Cassandra. Um, but you can generally see that it's linear scalable. So if you double, if you double your nodes, you're going to double your throughput and double your capacity. So I mentioned that Cassandra is a distributed database. So what does it actually mean? So if you take a look at the table over there on the right-hand side, um, you'll see that I have these three columns and this one uh, called country that I'm labeling a partition key. So what happens is as you create your tables and you store data, you're going to define a partition key. Cassandra is going to take that data and it's going to automatically distribute it around your cluster, right? Um, and you'll find that there's actually multiple copies of these and everything. But what's really key to understand here is that this, this, this distribution is actually naturally happening. Cassandra is doing this for you. 
And there's some bunch of benefits that you get with this. And so let me, I'm just gonna to explain replication factor and where this comes into play to help you understand why this distributed nature is, is, is cool, really. So the first thing I want you to notice is that each of these nodes has a number, right? So you see 0, 17, 33, and so on. The numbers here aren't actual token values, they're just here for illustration purposes, um, but hopefully it illustrates the point. So each node owns a set of tokens, a range of tokens. You see like 0, 17, 17 to 33, and so on and so forth. And when we say replication factor, what we're saying is how many replicas or nodes are going to have some data. So you see in this case, I have a replication factor of one where I have a single ring. That just means that each node only owns a one range of tokens. If I say replication factor of two, you see I added a ring and I shifted it. So if you look at the colors, you'll notice that now two nodes have a range of tokens. And then replication factor of three, which is the default. Now I have another ring, I shift it, I have three nodes that have a particular set of data. So what does this actually mean? Why am I telling you this? So if you look at some data that's coming into the system, let's say I'm gonna write data coming into the system. Well, as I mentioned before, Cassandra is a completely leaderless system. Any node can handle this request. It doesn't matter which one. When that node handles the request, it's what we call the coordinator. This is that same coordinator code that I was talking about that Stargate has open source and is using. Now, what will happen is once some node gets a particular request for some, you know, like a write of data, it's going to go, OK, well, three nodes, because I have a replication factor of three, three nodes need to get that data. OK, which nodes have the, the token range for that, that partition token that I have? And it's going to forward the data onto those three nodes. Now, this gets you a whole set of benefits, actually, because since I have multiple nodes that can own the data, not only is it good for performance, because now I can I can actually, you know, like round robin around or I can um, load balance around those nodes. But let's say a node goes down. There's something wrong here. Right. And Cassandra is built for, you know, for failures. It's built to handle um, failures and be very resilient. So if a node goes down, that coordinator will actually store what's called a hit. Um, and then when the node comes back up, it'll play it right back on the coordinator and it self heals, right? Um, so you can imagine some use cases, especially you could learn, you could lose two thirds of your capabilities in some cases and still have a database that is available and being able to return consistent data. Now, if you take a look at those data centers that I was talking about before, um, Cassandra uses that same replication to then replicate across data centers. So if you take a look at the left-hand side, you see I've got a set of data centers going across the globe there. So if I were to write some data, say, over in the, you know, to a node over in the west coast of the United States, that would immediately become available at the speed of wire to the other data centers and other nodes. So I could just say, read that from China, right? That would be really important if you want to geolocate data close to your users, um, which you need to do because latencies between, say, like Australia and the US are, are too, too, too big, right? So you want to get your data as close to your users as possible. Also, Cassandra is completely vendor agnostic. So whether you're talking, deploying on multiple cloud providers, major cloud providers, any other cloud providers, on-prem, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you can actually mix and match in a single database. OK, so some use cases. Let me just pop these up on the screen just to give you an idea where would you use Cassandra. Pretty much. Um, uh, you know, anything that has high throughput or high volume, I IoT cases, uh, time series, event streaming, um, things where we see it a lot actually in banking and in retail, inventory management. Uh, GDPR is a big one, right? Imagine I have multiple data centers. I can set different security uh, for those data centers and for the data that's being replicated to them. And as we just talked about from the cloud native standpoint, you can pretty much have any combination of hybrid or multi-cloud that you want. And then as a multi-model NoSQL database, Cassandra already supports a whole set of types. So column-oriented, maybe you know, most, most like the tabular structure we're all used to from relational databases. Key value, it fits at ex extremely well with its partitions. It's a, it's a sweet spot for time series databases. Um, and then graph is provided for in, in DataSex Enterprise. But the one I really want to get to here is the document store. Previously, if you wanted to store JSON documents in Cassandra, you could do it. But you had to go through a lot of work, and it was tightly coupled to a schema. That is no longer the case anymore. This is a schemaless document store. Um, so that document API I was talking about uh, through through um, uh, Stargate, you can just store JSON objects directly and retrieve them. No more having to be tied to any schema whatsoever. And so from a development standpoint, that really speeds things up. 
And it does this by what we call document shredding. So this, this data model you see here isn't something you have to worry about yourself. This is implemented under the hood. But what happens is the JSON object comes in through Stargate. It is parsing that data, and it's automatically splitting it up, and it's storing it, even nested values, whatever the JSON object is, it's being stored um, in the underlying Cassandra uh, data model for you. OK, so then finally then, where do you get Stargate? You go to Stargate IO. Um, so if you wanted to start using Stargate, uh, again, it's an open project. You can today with both Cassandra, open source Cassandra and Deus Ex Enterprise. Um, for those in the open source Cassandra world, if you wanted to get started right away, there are Docker images that are that exist for both of these. You can just spin them up and get going, and you can use Stargate right away. But if you wanted to actually like install it directly into your clusters, you can absolutely do that. Uh, tarballs and zips and such as well. Um, and then it's also available through Deus Ex Astra, uh, which is our serverless Cassandra in the cloud service. I'm not going to really get into that here. Uh, Cedric is going to cover that um, in his uh, workshop that's coming up pretty darn soon. Um, so if you want to get some hands-on with Stargate and really see it and what it does and, and kind of get into it, then definitely take a look at that. Uh, and then tomorrow, they'll be discussing Astra as well in a round table. Uh, so a lot more information on that. But really, uh, I only mentioned the Astra thing because you can use it for free and have all of Stargate there and implement it. But again, if you're using open source Cassandra or whatever, um, Stargate is open in there for you. And just finally, a couple resources for you um, from our team. All of this is free. Um, if you want to learn more about Cassandra and really get your teeth into it, uh, academy.datastacks.com. Um, there's datastacks.com slash dev, which has really cool embedded learning right there in the website. Um, so you can actually spin up a Cassandra instance in the cloud and, and just learn from there. There's community.datastacks.com, which is like Stack Overflow for Cassandra. And finally, there is the Datastacks Developers YouTube channel. We do workshops every week, um, and we have new content coming out usually every month. And with that, thank you so much. I know I'm at time, so I will... Uh, give it back over to our team here. Thank you, David. And we have actually some time to take a few questions. There are a Let's few. Do it. But I have important things to say to you first. First of all, I really uh, understood what you said in Finnish in the beginning oh, of the presentation. <laughs> so, I hope it wasn't terribly awful. I have so. not wasted. Uh, and, and then I have to say also uh, on your topic here that it kind of does, uh, I, I actually understood why the name um, is is the Stargate that it is or why you were talking about Stargate because that was one of my favorite TV series. I have yes. to Yes, I should have worn my Stargate shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of wish that there would be those, you know, wands and those, you know, weird guys from almost Egyptian um, were coming out of, <laughs> of the slide somewhere. So yeah, I missed that. But while uh, we are on the subject of of interesting things coming out of the Stargate, so we have Tarek's question here. Okay. So does it mean that if you want to build a full-scale end-to-end solution that you will need another service mesh to integrate Stargate with other API gateway for orchestrating all non-database APIs? <sighs> Heavy question. Yeah, right? Yeah, you can see I had my thinking face on there. Um, yeah. That's a that's a good question. So I guess I guess putting putting some of the question back is uh, is he talking about um, uh, specifically if not using like Cassandra or something like that, bringing in a different data store. Uh, I think if you're Tarek there, you can you can add to your question. But if I understand this correctly, I think that there, yeah, he his idea is that if you let's say have other business units or or uh, other teams that have like already APIs done in another mm -hmm. way, then yeah. how would you integrate to the uh, to the Stargate? You know, I guess I could see it coming in a couple different ways. I think it depends on what the APIs are, right? If you're using some of the ubiquitous APIs, things like REST, right? REST is pretty pretty well known. If you're already using REST um, and you're using it, let's pretend you're even you even created your own API uh, for Cassandra. You know, using a REST API for Cassandra, I, I know that exists out there in some applications. There's no doubt that if you were to move to what Stargate is doing. Um, then you would have to, you know, rework to use that particular REST API if you're going to do it that way. 
Um, now, could there be an opportunity, uh, given that Stargate is an open project and it is pluggable, could there be an opportunity to add another API to Stargate? Mm -hmm. PRs are a thing, right? Like, go, go, go make a PR. Um, so I think it just depends on what the API is. If it's one of the existing ones, I would probably use the the one presented by Stargate. But if it's a new API that's not on the list, I I think they would probably enjoy having uh, having another API added to the list. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So Tarek actually said that I'm referring to other non-storage related APIs, which was you know pretty much what we were talking about. But obviously, you can uh, continue the chat there. And otherwise, there are some uh, thanks to you from Mia and others in the chat. So uh, there are just some other questions related to legacy systems and data systems and, and, and hybrid environments. Uh, how would you start the design of data architecture um, in those environments and what are the key points you need to think of? I, I guess that this could be something answered either in the workshops or, or roundtables too, or if you yes. want to that. yeah. Yeah, I so, think I, I actually think that the uh, the roundtable is probably a great place for yeah. some of those questions. Um, not that the workshop isn't, um, but no, I, that's exactly what the roundtable I think is going to be for, um, yeah. and, and getting at some of those deeper questions there. Yes. Yeah. So make sure to drop by the data stacks roundtable, and there are some other questions that we don't have time to do right now. But I hope, David, that you or some of the other. Others are, are going to be able to answer those either here in the chat or in the in the roundtables or workshops. Thank you. Now.